Welcome to Motorcycle Hang Time with Chris Klotz, attorney at Stevenson Klotz Injury Lawyers. We invite you to hang with us as we talk about the local motorcycle scene, safety issues, and motorcycle law. And now, here's your fellow motorcycle rider and enthusiast and host. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Klotz with the Stevenson Klotz Injury Law Firm here in Pensacola, and welcome to Motorcycle Hang Time. This is a podcast that we do uh, that focuses on motorcycle riders and motorcycle interests and uh, tells stories and gives information for uh, people in the community uh, to get to know some of the influencers in the Pensacola area. And uh, today, we are super honored to have Ken Grant. So much to tell about you and your riding history. I'm going to let you introduce yourself and just describe just in a nutshell who you are, and then we'll kind of get into your riding history and your, your life story for motorcycle riding. Tell us a little bit, just basically who you are, Ken, and and uh, introduce yourself to our listeners today. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Chris. I certainly appreciate that. My name's Ken Grant. Uh, I've been a Motorcycle Safety Foundation instructor. This is my 20th year doing that. Um, also, I teach the police-level skills to civilian riders and police riders if they need it uh, here in Pensacola. I'm in my third year of doing that. Uh, definitely a long, lifetime uh, motorcycle rider. Started as a kid with dirt bikes. Uh, my wife and I had a motorcycle when we first got married. Hey, we had kids. We took the long hiatus, but once they got up and self-propelled, we went back into motorcycling, uh, primarily the touring type motorcycle. Started doing that for many years and then, uh, got into the teaching aspect it, uh, aspect of it and have just been, uh, involved with that for the past 20 years doing the teaching. Fascinating. So one of the things I always, I'm always so curious about is, our audience has heard me tell my story a couple times about how I had to kind of sneak around and ride motorcycles as a kid because my parents really were not on board with it. Um, but I'm always curious, like, what was your first ride? Do you remember your first ride? Was it on your bike? Did you borrow a bike? You know, how did, what was your first motorcycle that you had? And just like your very earliest memories getting you started out. Yeah. My first time ever riding a real motorcycle was a Kawasaki 90. My best friend back in junior high school, we called it. Uh, had a couple of dirt bikes and we'd go over there and ride them. And yeah, my dad didn't know about it because dad says, as long as you live in my house, you will not ride a motorcycle. Did uh, I will fast forward to when I graduated and went in the Marine Corps. What's one of the first things you do? Buy a motorcycle. Exactly. So, uh, but yeah, I started on the dirt bikes uh, back when I was probably 14 years old. Right. So it sounds like you have like a similar path as me. My trajectory, my parents were very much, you know, no motorcycles while you're in the house. Tell me a little bit about your experience with that. What do you think caused them to feel that way? Oh, well, I found out years later, the reason my dad did not want me to have a motorcycle is because he didn't want me to do the stupid things that he did on a motorcycle. Ah, uh, when see. he was a young male, uh, he was in the Navy, usually alcohol involved. So he was afraid I'd follow that same path, but uh, I, I did not. So, and I've enjoyed motorcycling ever since. So when you got off to uh, school, what was your first bike that you purchased for yourself? What was your, what was your, or I guess it was, you got off to the Marines and you purchased your first bike. What'd you get? Yeah, my wife and I bought us, a, it was a Yamaha 750, kind of a big standard cruiser type motorcycle that we had. I didn't have that for probably less than a year. And we moved up to an 850 with a fairing and saddlebags and all that good stuff. And even though we were, I mean, we were in our very early 20s, we were kind of already like the touring aspects of riding a motorcycle right from the beginning. You know, I never was the the speed demon and the sport bikes and things like that. So I guess I was kind of an old soul right from the beginning. Well, that's really cool because if I remember kind of your life story a little bit, you and your wife have been married for 41 years. Is that correct? That is correct. And you guys have been riding together that whole time. Has she always ridden with you or does she have her own bike or how has that played out through the years? Yeah, she did go. She's always ridden on the back with me everywhere we've ever gone. Now, she did go through a time. This was probably 15 years ago or so, she she decided, hey, I'll, I'll learn how to ride a motorcycle. So she learned how to ride, but she never really got the bug. It just really wasn't something that would interest her. If we'd get off on the bikes and go somewhere, she'd like, ah, I'll just get on the back with you. And after a while, she realized, you know, the front seat's not for her. She just prefers the back seat where, you know, she can read and have her snacks and take the pictures and all those good things that right. she does back there. And I know that you guys have a couple of children and some grandchildren 
What has been your philosophy with respect to your kids' writing and your grandchildren' writing? Do you have a strong feeling about that? I do. Now, my son, he definitely got the motorcycle bug. As soon as he got old enough, he was probably 17 or 18, and he learned how to ride a motorcycle, and he's been a motorcyclist ever since. Uh, my daughter never really cared for it much. Uh, even when we had a motorcycle when she was in high school, she rode, she'd ride on the back every once in a while, but it really wasn't something that she found enjoyable, and she just did her thing. So she's never really got into motorcycling. But my son not only rides, he's also an MSF instructor, so he teaches at the same school that, that I do. So I'm asking this partially for myself and partially for the audience because I know other people, you know, wrestle with this. I have two sons. One is 18 and, you know, he's off uh, out of the house and he's able to make his own decisions. Um, but I've got a 16 year old, too. And my 16 year old is the one who is much more interested in motorcycles and and things of that nature. He's got his driver's license. He's a safe driver. What advice do you have for parents who, like me, am wrestling with that with my son or could be daughter for somebody who's trying to, you know, do the calculus of, do I let, you know, my child get their riding endorsement and go through the courses and then do they get a motorcycle or not? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we all got to make those decisions. There's no doubt about it. There's two people that know your son more than anybody else. That's you and your wife. No one knows them better than you two. You just have to make the, the best decision based on with how you know his personality, how you know his maturity level, because there's no doubt it takes a different level of maturity to get out there on a motorcycle. And sometimes it's kind of sitting down with them. It's really kind of feeling them out. Do they really have the level of responsibility at that age? Because uh, I didn't ride on the street when I was 16 or 17. I was 18 before I got out on the street. And uh, there's no doubt I probably made a few uh, choices that I probably would definitely not make now, but we probably all did when we were young. So I will tell parents to, you know what, don't ever doubt your instincts as a parent. They'll always serve you well. In your training, have you worked with young people who are 16, 17, 18 years old before? And do you have any kind of conventional wisdom on, on young people who are that age that are working their way through a, a rider safety course? Yeah, we get them all the time. As a matter of fact, I just completed a class yesterday and one of my students was exactly 16 years old and he ended up being in the end. He was the, the best writer in the class when it was all said and done, but he was a very typical 16 year old, but he did have a level of maturity that I think that uh, will serve him well going out there and starting to ride on the street. And that's probably the biggest difference between young people and people of our age is that you know, they just don't make the same decisions that we do. They do things more in a hurry. We do things based on what we think is going to be safer. So the level of maturity has a lot to do with whether we think someone that's very young, 16 to 18, really should be out there on the street. Gotcha. And, you know, I've certainly met plenty. Yeah, you know, I've met both. I've met plenty of young people that I didn't think would be that responsible. And quite frankly, I've met some older people who I know that maybe they – you know, maybe they need to just maybe not ride motorcycles themselves because they have a hard time making good decisions too. So I guess it really, like you said, it really just, just does just depend on the individual and uh, kind of on a case by case decision. But it's really something that um, I've wrestled with myself because he wants to do it. And we are in active conversation about that subject right now. So I haven't landed on it yet, but I have an instinct on where I'm going to go. But uh, maybe that'll be for one of my later podcasts later this year. Yeah, we're still your, kind your of son is texting me right now saying, cheer dad on. Tell him say yes. <laughs> you know what? That would not surprise me one bit <laughs> if Sam had found you somehow and was texting you. That would be completely him. So kind of cut you off and I, I brought you back to your some of your first ride. You said that you started out with the 750 and then y'all got was an 850 that had fairing and was a little bit more of a touring setup. Mm -hmm. And that was something that you and your wife did together. You know, that's another really interesting topic that I haven't had somebody who has near the experience, you know, riding as a couple. Are there any thoughts that you have after now riding for four, would it be fair to say you've been married for 41 years, you and your wife have been riding for 41 years together? Any advice to uh, young couples or couples who are doing long trips together and setups? You know, your wife or your spouse or your significant other, whoever's on the back, they have to be able to enjoy it too. Uh, definitely want to take their wants, needs, and desires into consideration, uh, no matter where you're going, how long you're going to ride, the type of bike you're going to ride. 
All those factors need to be in there, and it really is a team effort. Matter of fact, we don't call our wives passengers. We like to call them co-riders because they have an active component back there, too. There's many times, especially on some of the long-distance things that we do, uh, you know, we can be in the saddle 10, 12 hours in a day as we're sure. trying to get someplace, you know, we're crossing the country and things like that, that she's an active p- part of the the motorcycling experience. You know, she has, she's warned me a couple of times. Hey, do you see that off to your right? Oh, yep. Thank you. Appreciate that. So get them involved. Don't just set them back there and forget about them. Get, get them involved also. I have not been obviously riding as long as you have. So I'm going to ask you back. I'm assuming y'all have headsets now for communication. But when you guys started out 41 years ago, uh, the communication between you and your co-rider uh, was probably a lot different. How has the uh, technology changed to enhance you guys? What was it like when you all first started out? And where has technology taken you guys as a couple? Oh, absolutely. When we first got started, you know, of course, she's sitting on the back, no backrest and just holding on to me. Uh, you know, which when you're young, you really kind of like that stuff. You know, and if we ever needed to communicate, <laughs> sure, we're st- we're screaming above the wind, no windshields, all that kind of stuff. And then we got into the touring bikes. And then uh, after the kids got self-propelled and we bought our first Goldwing, and that had the intercom and the CB radios and the AM, FM, XM, you name it. We had all the technologies on there. Just totally changed everything, you know. Now she can tell me, um, honey, we need to find a rest stop. I need to visit the ladies' room. So that <laughs> level of communication makes things a lot easier for everybody involved. There are almost 9 million motorcycles registered in the United States, and there are almost 5,000 motorcycle fatalities a year. That's almost 14 a day. Motorists don't do a good job looking out for motorcycles, and neither do insurance companies. Hi, I'm Chris Klotz, and as a rider and an attorney, I know that insurance companies treat motorcycle cases differently. If you've been injured in a motorcycle accident, bring your case to me to review. Let me take my riding experience and my knowledge of how to deal with insurance companies to get you the compensation that you deserve. The call and the advice during the call are free. Stevenson Klotz Injury Lawyers, bring it. What would you say is the longest trip that you and your wife have taken in terms of time and maybe also distance if those two happen to overlap with one another? Yeah, that one's easy. We took a trip uh, back in 2010 was our longest. It was 30 days and it was 9,000 miles. We never sat in an automobile. Can you share with us just a little bit where you guys went? That is an amazing odyssey. How cool. Yeah, it was a trip of a lifetime and we still look at pictures of it today. And as a matter of fact, some of the places we were, we're going back again this summer. Uh, we've been out there before, but this time we're going back to some of those key areas. Basically, we left here. Kind of did a beeline up to uh, South Dakota, went through Sturgis, uh, Mount Rushmore, Badlands, Custer State Park, all those types of things, over to Wyoming, through Yellowstone, Montana, Idaho, down through the Grand Tetons, all through that part of uh, the area, through um, parts of Utah. Some of that stuff was amazing. Over into Colorado, all through the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, without a doubt. Number one state for motorcycling. If you've never been out there, you got to get out there. Oh, by the way, a little preview. That's where we're going again this summer. We're going back to Colorado. I have not ridden in Colorado, and that's definitely on my list of places. The other place that you mentioned that is super awesome, and and my law partner, Eric, and I have been there um, almost every year for the last few years when we go out to do some hunting out in South Dakota uh, Mm -hmm. is the Badlands. I can't even imagine how cool it is. I mean, it's breathtaking enough being in a car going through the Badlands. I can't even imagine what it's like to really spend a lot of time going through the Badlands on a motorcycle. That's about one of the prettiest places I've seen. It is, you know, and the thing I like about riding a motorcycle around all over the country is that, you know, in a car, you can see things, you can get out and you can experience things. But when you're on a motorcycle, you not only see it, When you're going through different places, you can feel it and you can literally taste it. We've been through places where riding through cornfields in Kansas, you can literally taste the corn. We've been through places where it's nothing but uh, vineyards. You can smell and you can literally taste the grapes, the honeysuckle, all the different things that you're doing. And sometimes when the weather changes, I mean, 
We've been through places, all of a sudden, it's like you just rode into a refrigerator when you go around the side of a mountain in the morning and the sun's not there and all that cold air is being held in that canyon. There's nothing like it. You don't get that in a car because you're too insulated. But we definitely feel it uh, and experience it on a motorcycle. That's why we love it so much. Yeah, so just a quick interesting story about that phenomenon. I completely agree with you. And I'm sure anybody that's out there that's riding knows this and has this same experience. But when you ride, you can taste, smell, feel the changes. And, you know, sometimes you'll ride through a dip that just dips a little bit, like you're going over a bridge and you hit a cold spell. And you can actually feel everything. It's a much more sensory way of traveling. And so what I learned from motorcycle riding is that, and I haven't bought a ton of houses in my life, but I have moved around some. And as an adult, when I've figured out where I want to live, riding motorcycles has made me get out of my car and go walk around a neighborhood. Because that experience of actually being out of your vehicle, you can walk around a neighborhood and see what the different smells and feels and flavors are that are in a neighborhood when you're thinking about buying a house or you want to get to know, you know, a place where you're going to actually be a little bit better, it really gives you the opportunity to experience it in a, in a way that you don't get to if you're just in an air-conditioned box with windows. So that's a really, really cool observation. And it's something that I think that people who don't road, ride motorcycles have any appreciation that they might be going through about 10 or 12 little different microclimates just as they're driving to work in the day. That's right. And it's the different smell, the temperature, everything. And, you know, when you ride in places, especially the higher elevations, you know, that when you talk about the air is crisp, now you re you really don't understand it mean, understand what it means until you actually are there. And some of that stuff is just absolutely amazing. Seeing this country is great. Seeing it from the seat of a motorcycle is like no other experience out there. Yeah, that's so true. It's probably a little bit different now with all the electronic um, ignitions and everything. But when you were traveling back when you first started to ride and do cross country trips, um, when you had the naturally aspirated or carbureted, you know, engines and you were going through different elevations, did you ever have any experience with that where you had to like do a quick tune up or change your carburetor settings at all when you are traveling like that? I did not. Uh, the motorcycle we took out West, we still own it. Matter of fact, we've owned that motorcycle for 21 years now. It's a 2003 Goldwing. It is uh, fuel injected. So it kind of takes care of itself. It doesn't sure. have all the electronic parts of it that the newer ones have. But uh, no, there was no problems whatsoever out there with that. And yeah, pretty much the carburetor has gone the way of the dodo bird. For a while there, I had a Yamaha SR500 Thumper single engine 500cc oh, yeah. with an original carburetor on it. And I cafeed it a, a few years ago. Well, actually, it's a lot of years ago now, but um, used to always have to tinker with that carburetor, man. It mm -hmm. was always, Absolutely. always required some attention. So um, it was fun. So now tell me, has your riding changed now? Are you more local? Do you still do trips or tell me what your focus on your pleasure riding is now? What do y'all do? Yeah. Um, my wife and I still ride two up. We're blessed that we have three motorcycles. We still have that gold wing. Uh, we have our two up touring Harley Davidson limited that we do a lot of lo more local things on and We've taken it on distance trips also. And then I have my police road King and that's the one I really play on and compete on and I teach on and things like that. But, uh, our long distance riding, we usually take at least one big trip a month or a year. Uh, now that we're both technically retired, although I'm still teaching, um, uh, maybe there'll be some more trips involved throughout the year, but uh, gotcha. we do, we like to go on the shortest trip we'll ever take is usually two to 3000 miles somewhere between there and 9,000 is kind of our target range. <laughs> that is so awesome. That's really cool. So, and last thing I want to talk just about in your personal life is your competition. Tell us a little bit about um, your competing. I know that you facilitate some competitions, but it sounds like you're also still, are you actively riding in competitions yourself? Yep, I sure am. I got involved in that back in 2017. I met a local Pensacola police officer that was uh, really involved with that. And he got me involved with that. And I'll tell you, we call it a cone addiction because we're out there with those great big cones and we're addicted to them and they really are. It's an amazing sport that we get out there and play it with. So for the last seven years, I've been heavily involved with that and still do the competing to this day. But I've also moved into the instruction side of it with Lock and Lean. Uh, Lock and Lean is a course that's actually out of Rockford, Illinois. You're thinking Rockford, Illinois, that's a long way from here, Ken, but uh, I'm now a satellite location for Lock and Lean, 
And uh, I do teach that level, of course. And that's really a, a whole nother level of enjoyment is watching people that want to ride at that level and giving them the skills and, uh, and teaching them how to actually do it and watching them also get addicted to this level of riding. I am very curious about that. And so I've had the basic riding course that I took out of Harley and I, you know, I've got years of experience, but the lock and lean is a little bit intimidating to me just because I know that is a skill set that I definitely could benefit from getting better at. But what level of experience do you think somebody needs to have to really engage in the lock and lean course? Do you have like prerequisites for somebody wanting to come do that? Or do you like give somebody a tryout before you let them participate in that course? Or, or how do you all figure out who's a good fit for that? Most of it is really desire. If you have the basic fundamentals of how to operate the motorcycle, we can take that skill level and we can move you into this uh, police level. It does start off basic. Uh, and we start really right from the fundamentals, and it's a building block process. We don't immediately throw you into these competition patterns that you may see on YouTube and things like That's that. That's what I've seen. Right. <laughs> That's intimidating we, it, looking. No, absolutely. And you're like, where are these people going? What are they doing? How do they even know where to go? Well, we start from the bottom, and we build that up. And uh, we like to say, hey, if you got the motivation, we got the ability to teach you. So um, if you got the want to do it, we can definitely get you out there and teach you how to use these motorcycle skills to their fullest. And I asked somebody this the other day that I saw a Florida Highway Patrolman who was doing a demonstration. And uh, I said, how many times am I going to drop my bike when I start learning how to do this? <laughs> In that course, should I make plans to get a bike that I can drop? Because I don't necessarily want to drop my daily driver a lot. I mean, and should I find a friend who might loan me a bike they don't mind if I if I beat up on a little bit? You know, that's always one of the biggest concerns. I don't want to drop my bike, you know, things like that. But we like to tell people, look, you're going to drop your motorcycle. You cannot ride your motorcycle to its limit until you exceed those limits. Well, when you're training at this level, yes, you will exceed your limits and you're going to drop the motorcycle. It's it's pretty common. I promise you there's no one in Pensacola, Scambia County, that's dropped a motorcycle more than I have. <laughs> but guess what I've learned? I'm not going to hurt the motorcycle. It's yeah. not going to hurt it a bit. You put the proper protection on the motorcycle, you're not going to hurt it. You pick it up and you go again. Um, so it's not that really big a deal. What we do find is that early on, we do drop the motorcycle from time to time as we're learning. I like to say the more you drop it in training, the less you'll ever drop it out there in the real world. And that's what it really comes to. I don't drop my motorcycle anymore. Uh, now, there'll be times I'm training very hard or we're trying to make those competition patterns we're working on smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're just challenging ourselves. Sometimes it's all about just getting out there and having fun with it. But it's all about, you know, putting the proper protection on your motorcycle. Now, one thing a lot of people don't know is we actually have some rental motorcycles that people can ride during the training. Uh, we have a police road king that's right here in Pensacola that if someone is looking to get into this level of training, that rental motorcycle is available. And you can drop it all you want. You're not going to hurt it. Where's the lock and lean stationed out of? Where's the base for y'all here? Right here at Pensacola Harley-Davidson, same place that I teach the uh, Motorcycle Safety Foundation courses. We also teach the lock and lean courses. Aaron, the owner over there at Pensacola Harley, along with Justin Mattis, the general manager, they are all in 110% into training, and they let us teach any courses out there they want uh, that we would like. And they love for people to come back and continue to practice and train right there on their property, their asphalt. They don't have no problem with that whatsoever. They don't care what brand you're riding either. If you got a motorcycle and you want to come over and get some training, you want to go over there and practice, please come over to Pensacola Harley. They would love to have you. It's all about the safety. Yeah, that's a great yes, attitude. So let's give a shout out real quick to the lock and lean business. If somebody wants to get in touch and gets plug, get plugged in with the lock and lean course, how would they reach out to you? Really easy. Lockandlean.com. You go there, you click on the schedule, you can see all the different levels of courses that are available. We teach them here in Pensacola. We teach them at the, what we call it the mothership up there in Rockford, Illinois. They're also taught in uh, New Jersey and in Pennsylvania. Gotcha. And I do want to talk about your other business, um, bikertraining.net. Tell us a little bit about what that is and how to plug into that and, and what that offers. 
Yeah, bikertraining.net is the contract provider for all the Motorcycle Safety Foundation courses at Pensacola Harley. Uh, we've been over there in association with them for the past five or six years. Love teaching, love working with those folks. Those people, like I said earlier, are all in on training. Uh, absolute professionals over there uh, at Pensacola Harley. And they really let us get out there and um, do what needs to be done to teach the next generation of motorcyclists. And is that basic or advanced or are both of those options available through biker training? Biker training, the vast majority of what we do over there is teaching the basic rider course, people that are coming in to learn how to ride a motorcycle and get their endorsement. We also have level different levels of training for that. We have what's called the experienced riders course. We have a three-wheel basic rider course. If you don't want to ride a two-wheeler, you want to ride a three-wheeler, we can sign you up and get you trained on a three-wheeler also. Perfect. Well, boy, Ken, this has been one of the fastest podcasts that I've done. <laughs> you have an amazingly cool riding history, and you have so much really good information about riding. Thank you very much for being our guest on this podcast of Motorcycle Hang Time. Are there any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to leave our audience with about motorcycling? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Chris. I certainly appreciate, always enjoy uh, talking motorcycles with anybody and certainly with you. One of the things with motorcyclists, you as a parent, we're all concerned about motorcycle fatalities. Now, there's a couple things we can all do to really reduce the chances of becoming a fatality on the motorcycle. One, ride sober. Two, wear a helmet. If you do those two things, you're significantly going to reduce your chances of being a fatality on the motorcycle. And I'll add in the third, get trained. The more training you receive, the better rider you'll become. The chances of you getting even injured on a motorcycle, again, are significantly reduced. Amen, brother, on all of that above, but also the training. And there's so many good outlets for training here. And listening audience, you've been listening to one of the most experienced, best ones here in town. So y'all check out both of the programs that Ken's involved with, bikertraining.net and lockandlean.com. And Ken, thank you so much for being with me. Again, I'm Chris Klotz. This is Motorcycle Hang Time. I'm one of the attorneys here at Stevenson Klotz Law Firm in Pensacola. And uh, Ken, I'll catch you next time. I really I may have to have you come back so I can ask you some of the really good questions that uh, we didn't even have time to get to. But thank you again for being with us today. I'd love it. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you. Right on. Peace. Thanks for hanging out with us on Motorcycle Hang Time with Chris Klotz. Go to stevensonklotz.com to get more information about motorcycle safety issues and motorcycle law. Please leave us a rating and a review whenever you listen to your podcast. We invite you to spend time with us on our next episode.